Hey everybody, this is Rooted in Revelation podcast, where we seek to make God's revelation our foundation in all of life. And with us, we have Jason Hunt, who's a very special guest, who happens to have have a book published on uh, Cornelius Van Til and the doctrine of God and its relevance for contemporary hermeneutics. So this is a topic that is very interesting to me. I think a lot about biblical interpretation, especially from a kind of Van Til perspective, and it's incredible someone's wrote about this, specifically Jason Hunt. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. It's a it's an honor. I've, I've seen some of the previous guests you've had on here, and it's very humbling. Uh, uh, you, you've had some giants on here in terms of Van Til studies, John <laughs> Frame and and James Anderson. Uh, those are big time guests. So yeah yeah they're they're very humble and it was i i don't even know how they came on our show but we're very <laughs> grateful for it um yeah you know so we we tend to have a pretty strong van Til bent to our our show we we try to do a lot of stuff with a, a van Til kind of perspective which we believe is the most biblical um so that's why we do it not because van Til did it we just see right. van Til adopting and doing what the Bible has always been saying um, in a very authentic way. So we're really grateful for Van Til and how the Lord used him uh, specifically in apologetics, but even more so the influence that it's been having on all kinds of other things, you know, yeah. specifically your book. Um, so before we hop in, Jason, you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, how the Lord sure. saved you and, and how you kind of got to where you are now and what's up with all that? Sure. Um, I currently live in South Carolina, and I've been here for over 20 years, but I'm originally from the Midwest. Uh, my parents are from Illinois. I grew up moving around quite a bit um, with my dad's job. He moved around a lot, and we were always church-going folks, um, but I would have to say that I didn't become a Christian until I was 18. I was... Uh, you know, I went along with my parents to church uh, every Sunday. At that time, we were going to a Methodist church uh, in Illinois. And, uh, but, you know, as I got into the teen years, uh, I kind of want to do my own thing and uh, explore my own uh, path. And that led to a number of problems, of course, uh, as you can imagine uh, what teenagers get into. But uh, so I, I really was uh, looking back on that period of my life, I would say I was certainly not a believer, um, until I was 18. Um, a number of things sort of contributed to that. Uh, I was a disillusioned person, I believe, uh, about life, about the meaning in life and purpose and all of that. I saw the emptiness of a lot of things I was pursuing and, uh, my parents were this we were actually living in Georgia at this time so we were in the south and we were my parents were going to a, a southern baptist church down there and I started going back to church with them I had not been going for a while I refused to go and uh you know I was impressed by the love the christian love that people showed toward me some of them knew exactly what I was involved with too at that point in my life so it was I was a, made a big impact and I had heard the gospel many times, um, but just it all kind of came to a head and uh, the Lord sort of opened my heart and I saw my need for Christ and I placed my faith in him and asked for his forgiveness. And it was for me, it was a total paradigm shift. You know, I, I had gone in a, the opposite direction uh, for a while. And so I felt like I was seeing the world through a new lens, basically, and saw, uh, you know, the beauty of God in his creation, and of course, in his redemptive work in Christ. So that, uh, that's sort of the short story of my conversion. Um, since then, I was, I was involved with the campus ministry right after I graduated from high school, went to University of Georgia, got involved with the campus ministry, it was Campus Crusade for Christ at the time. Now it's called Crew. Um, and I was discipled and, uh, you know, people were pouring into my life and I was learning a lot. And I ended up actually going on staff with that ministry. And that's where I met my wife. Uh, so I was on staff at Ohio State and down here at University of South Carolina. 
And it was during that time that the Lord sort of uh, stirred my heart and gave me the interest and the passion for studying his word. And I, that's where I uh, really decided to go to seminary full time and work in church ministry on the side. And, and I went to RTS Charlotte. Uh, I was there before Dr. Anderson got there, but uh, um, studying under so many great godly men uh, that made a big impact on me. And then I continued to pursue my studies overseas in uh, Wales and the UK. Uh, that's where I finished out. So that's kind of, and I'm currently a uh, pastor of the PCA Church here in Columbia. And uh, so ordained in the PCA. But uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. Great. Thanks so much for sharing, Jason. And uh, it's funny because uh, we're also in the PCA, uh, me and Sam specifically, that's our church. And our pastor is named Jonathan Hunt. So I asked my pastor, yeah, I said, are you related to a Jason Hunt? He's like, no, I don't know. I don't think so. So I went went to uh, seminary with a John. uh, I think his name was John Hunt. Uh, yeah, no, it was, he, it was Jake. I'm sorry. Jake. So was, okay. Yeah. Different, Cause different our pastor, guy. he, he went to, uh, <clears throat> he went to, I'm sorry, uh, Jackson, uh, okay. RTS. Yeah. And he, he was, I think he was a TA with, uh, uh, Lincoln Duncan for a little bit when he was down there. Okay. And that, that's another thing I do on the side here besides, uh, pastor in the church is, uh, I work as a TA part-time with, uh, the global campus of RTS, uh, so I'm a TA for their Greek classes online and then a systematic class. Great. Yeah, that's great. Well, now I'm sure you notice a couple more heads pop in here. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So Sam's up there. He goes to my church, Colin. These are all our hosts, you know, it's like the okay. dream team and, yeah. for, and we're all here <laughs> for once. And, okay. uh, and that's uh, Colin. He's a, he's a minister in, go ahead, Colin. I'll let you, you share. Yeah, I'm a pastor and church planner at Great Basin Reformed Presbyterian Church in um, Reno, Nevada. So I'm with the RPCNA. I was born in Reno, Nevada, believe it or not. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah, one of my parents' uh, moving uh, journey, uh, they lived out there for a short. I I don't even remember it. I was only out there for about a year of my life. But, yeah, it's probably a lot different here than it was when your parents were here. Oh, yeah. That was in the um, mid-70s. Basically so. become California. Okay. So, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, so, Con, I just sent you over the questions, too, so you can have a look at them. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll we'll go ahead and hop into this. Uh, for, the, for the guys that just hopped in, we're going to be talking about uh, – you know, Cornelius Van Til and its and his relevance with his theology proper, the doctrine of God specifically, and its relevance to contemporary hermeneutics. So, so Jason, maybe with that uh, being started, maybe you could t- lay out for us what exactly hermene- hermeneutics are for those that may be listening and don't even know what that is. Sure. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I talk about it in my book some um, at the beginning about defining hermeneutics and, and I sort of make a case for Van Til's uh, place in the discussion based on that partly. Um, you know, I think it's been defined in many different ways through the years. Um, in earlier times, perhaps, uh, the emphasis was on sort of a set of rules for interpretation, principles, uh, really a focus on methodology. Whereas in contemporary hermeneutics, it's become much broader than that. It surely includes that, but I would say now uh, the predominant definition of hermeneutics would be a theory of interpretation involving worldview elements, uh, ontology, epistemology, and ethics. Uh, So it's much broader. It's much more philosophical in focus uh, in the contemporary discussion. But, uh, you know, a basic definition would be theory of interpretation or philosophy of interpretation. Great. Thanks for that, yeah. Jason. Sure. So wh- what got you into Van Til specifically? And then how, how has he uniquely and helpfully helped you specifically in this area of study when you kind of got into hermeneutics and whatnot? Yeah, my first introduction to Van Til wasn't until seminary. I'd never heard of him up to that point. 
and I took an apologetics class at RTS Charlotte. Um, Dr. Michael Kruger was the professor at that time before Anderson got there, and we had to read Van Til's Christian Apologetics, which is probably his most basic text um, that's available, and I know they've done some new editions of those with some helpful footnotes uh, explaining some of his uh, terminology and, and his meaning, but um, that book was eye-opening for me. First of all, it's very strikingly different than most apologetic texts. I mean, if you've, if you've read the book, he, he, he starts off, like with many of his books, he starts off talking about sort of a primer in systematic theology. And you're kind of like, I thought this was a book on apologetics. What's he talking about systematics? But that's part of his approach, of course, as you find out. But, uh, but one of the things that struck me as I read through that book was the light bulb came on. I remember sitting in a Starbucks and reading that and thinking, you know what? What he's talking about changes the whole playing field if we take this seriously in terms of the lens through which we're interpreting reality as a whole, and then all the other particulars that fall into that. Um, and it's applicable way beyond uh, apologetics because of its scope. So that that's what really struck me. And then I would say later, um, I took a class in hermeneutics at RTS. A lot of times it's informally taught through the through the biblical classes where you're going through books of the Bible, but there was a, a class towards the end of the curriculum called Advanced Biblical Exegesis, and in there he covers, there's a lot of things are covered there, but in the beginning it, there was a number of uh, lessons on, you know, what we bring to the text before we interpret, before we even begin to uh, unpack the text, you know, what are we bringing to it in terms of presuppositions, assumptions, all our theological baggage or lack thereof. And so Van Til was brought into the discussion in relation to hermeneutics there, but then sort of he kind of disappeared or, you know, we focused on other things after that. And the thought occurred to me, you know, some of the things I've read in his works really apply uh, on a macro hermeneutical level, and I talk about that in the first chapter of the book, uh, to a number of concerns in contemporary philosophical hermeneutics. So he, I think there's much more that could be said here. Um, and if you have a copy of the, I think it's the second edition of his Christian Apologetics, um, William Edgar is the editor of that. Um, and he talks in the introduction Right towards the end, he suggests other fields of study that his thought would apply to, and one of those is hermeneutical philosophies. And putting all those pieces together, it was like, there's an idea, <laughs> you know, to pursue something worth pursuing. So that, that's kind of where I came to this topic uh, from my experience. Mm. And then a step back a little bit, yeah. Jason, how, how, how was, how did you get so interested in biblical interpretation and, yeah, yeah. and, and things of that nature as well? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, you're always doing interpretation, you know, whatever level of ministry you're doing is you're interacting with the scriptures, um, you know, whether it's a Sunday school lesson or small group Bible study, you're, you're doing interpretation all the time. And I think as you do it more and more, you start to realize how crucial it is and how complex it is. And so, you know, just on a practical need level, um, I saw the need to explore hermeneutical method uh, in more depth. And I would say through my academic studies, if you do any kind of graduate work in theology, the majority of what you're starting to focus on at that level is methodology and specifically hermeneutical methodology. And you see this, you know, uh, from all different quarters, not conservative reform quarters, but, you know, what's popular in academia with regard to hermeneutics, you got uh, various approaches, you know, you have reader response approaches, you have feminist approaches, you have 
uh, homosexual approaches to hermeneutics. Um, you have lib various liberation theology approaches to the scriptures with all kinds of uh, with methods that have all kinds of uh, assumptions built into them. So from the local church level to the academic level, this is a key uh, field, a uh, key thing that we need to attend to because I would argue to say the spiritual battle rages on every level, even the hermeneutical level, uh, worldview level, all of that. So um, well, there's just a few thoughts. Good, good. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so we'll go to the next question here, Jason. Uh, based on your book, you display a vast overview of the and, and surveying the field of hermeneutical methodologies. Uh, maybe you could share with uh, our listeners and our hosts here what are some of these, and then speak yeah. about some of the concerns you have regarding their methods. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I go into much greater detail than I'll go into here in the book, but. Uh, in terms of the specifics, but I guess if I had to generally categorize them, uh, the ones that I encountered in the book, I would say there's two general approaches that you find out there in in the hermeneutical world. And and one, you know, I apologize for oversimplifying these categories because there's many nuances you could make, but sort of a modernist uh, camp or modernist slash rationalistic camp approach to hermeneutics uh, with an emphasis on objective meaning usually found in the human author. Um, that characterizes a lot of enlightenment influenced hermeneutical methods. Uh, on the flip side, uh, we have the more of a postmodern um, category of method which really focuses on the reader uh, in terms of meaning found in the reader. Now, generally the hermeneutical situation, you have uh, author, text, and reader, and there's been theories centered around each one of those three things uh, as part of uh, the process. But the, but the postmodern would obviously gravitate more on the flip side to uh, more irrationalistic, although that's a more of a negative term that they probably wouldn't use as much for themselves. But um, we would say, sort of, you have one pole, you have rationalistic and then irrationalistic methods, or at least 10 that way on the spectrum. Um, it's interesting, too, that, you know, as I survey a lot of those methods, uh, most of the general hermeneutical philosophies, and when I say general, I mean not specific to biblical interpretation, but just in general, what I found were many of the methods were reacting against the modernist approach. So there's a very conscious reaction. And whereas a lot of the evangelical methods used among uh, popular among evangelical circles that I surveyed are uh, trying to guard against postmodern ideas, and many of them retreating back to modernist notions, modernist assumptions. Um, and then there were some other recent uh, developments, I think I mentioned in chapter three about uh, which I felt were some helpful correctives to evangelical methods that I surveyed prior to that. And that would be uh, speech act theory and the theological interpretation of scripture movement, which um, some would say, well, we've always been doing that in the church and they would be right to a degree, but it's, it's actually sort of formalized as a movement now uh, among evangelical interpreters. So, those are, and I can talk later about, you know, some of the positive contributions of those, but in terms of concerns, so those are some methods, but general concerns, um, there's, there's a tendency, especially among the general hermeneutical approaches to uh, focus on one aspect of the hermeneutical process to the exclusion of the others. 
you know, either focus on the author to the exclusion of the text and the reader, or on down the line, text or reader to the exclusion of the author. Um, and what I found were these things. I found, um, and this kind of gets into chapter three, where I talk about the relationship between metaphysics and hermeneutics. Um, metaphys metaphysics being, I use that term and ontology is synonymous or interchangeable terms, you know, theory of reality. Um, and what I found in these uh, general methods were a tendency to uh, either, you know, to deny that you can know uh, a clear metaphysic or an ontology, but at the same time smuggling that in to their theories and to their methods. So there's an explicit denial, but then a smuggling in of ontological assumptions. And then I found um, pretty much across the board, and this will tie into Van Til's uh, thought, if you're familiar with him at all, uh, I found a general finite ontology being assumed prior to any text under consideration. And this general finite ontology was a one level ontology sort of a, you know, uh, a reality in general that applies to everything. And what this does is when it comes to interpreting the Bible, if you're using this approach, this type of ontology being assumed, it precludes any biblical ontology from the get-go. Um, you're sort of setting the, you're stacking the deck or you're setting the table in a way that's going to influence then the conclusions you arrive at. Um, so you're setting a playing field which is already incompatible with the biblical worldview and ontology. And Jason, then, yeah. Um, quick question. Sure. Um, that finite ontology yeah um would and you say it's it's one level it's a one level view of reality yeah um would you tie that to what van till um called the monistic assumptions of yes of fallen men and could you give some examples of people who who or um or just examples of, of that yeah yeah working out yeah um that does relate to what Van Til's talking about there. And I think even Peter Jones came out with a book called One or Two. Um, it's kind of a worldview level book rooted. I see a heavy influence of Van Til there where, you know, is, is reality one thing or is it actually two levels? And of course, Van Til would say it's two levels. It's creator and everything else. You know, there's two types of reality in that sense. So yeah, um, so this one level ontology that's assumed in a lot of these methods, and I, uh, I guess, um, you know, there's a number of examples, I would say, I'll just use a couple giants in the field of uh, secular hermeneutics. Um, Heidegger, although he wasn't, um, you know, he, he's known for his philosophy, but uh, with many implications and in influenced many figures that followed in philosophical hermeneutics and his um, design concept of being in the world. And he goes on and on about nuancing this and it's very confusing, it's very convoluted. <laughs> if you read any of his stuff, it's very out there and it's hard to understand, but it seems clear that whatever distinctions he's making in the hermeneutical process or in understanding reality, uh, everything's enveloped in this. So, you know, whatever progress or distinctions are being made, it's, it's sort of being undermined by this one level ontology. Um, you know, it almost takes on a godlike status, uh, this sort of self-interpreting, you know, all-encompassing thing of being in the world 
um, sort of takes on godlike characteristics. Now, one of the uh, huge figures in philosophical hermeneutics more directly is Gadamer, uh, who influenced a number of folks, uh, including Anthony Thistleton. He, he wrote a book called the, uh, the Two Horizons, which is really lifted from uh, Gadamer's theory of fusing the horizon of the author and the reader to make to find understanding. Well, in his, um, you know, fusing of the horizons, it's, he retains some of that being language, you know, everything's being, but it's being uh, revealed through language. So language becomes uh, the sort of a master category of reality, uh, which is finite. And it's um, one level. And, and others have done this with other categories like history. Um, that's a big concern in philosophical hermeneutics. It's, it's something we have to deal with it in, in terms of interpretation. But it, whether you're talking about being, language, or history, these are all forms of this one level ontology that you find in these methods. So that, that, those, those would be a few examples of those things. Do you want to go ahead and ask the next one, uh, next one Colin? Sure. Um, so, so what uh, are some of the most influential people that have shaped contemporary hermeneutics? So I, I think you've thrown some names out there and um, those who aren't seminary educated might not be familiar with sure. some of those names, but who, who are some of the um, influential people, especially those that maybe people have heard of before that have um, shaped contemporary hermeneutics? Yeah, I would say, um, again, I, I went, I had to go back a little bit um, in the book to talk about some philosophical influences uh, because of their treatment of ontology that had an impact on more uh, direct figures in the field of hermeneutics. So I talk about Kant as an influence uh, ontologically. Um, yeah, I get th these are more on the general side, not biblical specific, uh, but Kant, Schleiermacher, he did do biblical hermeneutics, but uh, from a very, uh, what we would call very liberal secular uh, perspective of his time. Um, I would say uh, who else? Um, Heidegger, Boltmann, Gadamer, Derrida, who is a postmodern philosopher, deconstructionist. These are main players, again, from more of the secular perspective. Now, it's interesting when it comes to um, the evangelical influence, you know, who are some of the figures that had an influence uh, in those circles. And one main um, influence uh, is E.D. Hirsch, who wrote a book called Validity in Interpretation. And he is, because of his, he was not a uh, self-consciously Christian interpreter. He was a secular uh, literary critic, actually, and he talks about his influences, and they're not Christian figures or theologians per se, but what appealed to many evangelicals about Hirsch was that he um, focused on the human author. He sort of stood against uh, some of the tendencies of uh, those who would lean more towards an uh, open-ended, irrationalistic approach where it was open to sort of meaning construction and reader response uh, tendencies, he really went back to the human, you know, the, the author, we would call human author as we talk about the scriptures to make that distinction, but he's just saying the author in any text is sort of the, the controller of meaning. And that had a heavy influence on evangelicals who were wanting to fight against sort of postmodern tendencies. Um, now, that in some ways became a problem because 
um, he he's he's coming at it from a, a not a self-consciously biblical or Christian perspective. So he 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 has really no place for a divine author controlling meaning. He has a place for the human author in human texts, and but his his influence tended to be uh, very strong in the evangelical world. Others I would list, um, perhaps in a more positive light. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll mention Thistleton because he's a giant in the area of uh, hermeneutics and biblical studies. He's a British evangelical, so in, in many ways he would be a more on the left-leaning side of perhaps where we are coming from. Um, and he's great at describing the various philosophers and their views but you're kind of left wondering what what does he believe you know where is he coming from you know he's describing all these and analyzing them but uh in terms of his own view it, he kind of keeps that under wraps for me personally uh Vern Poitras is a is a giant in reformed Mantillian hermeneutics uh he's written a lot of very stimulating texts in that regard, really exploring the divine meaning in scripture, the fullness of meaning. Uh, but uh, Van Hooser is another one who's combined elements of speech act theory and, and theological interpretation of the scriptures. Um, and I mentioned the theological interpretation. Uh, Daniel Trier is another name that's sort of he's writing a lot of things in that area. And then lastly, I would mention um, G.K. Beale, along with D.A. Carson and their work on the New Testament use of the old. Those are some, uh, I'm sure there's many others to mention, but those are some big figures. So how does um, Van Til between all of these different methods of interpretation, so you've sort of described the um, uh, postmodern view and then people react against it and maybe retreat back to a modernistic view, focusing right. just on the human author. And then um, between those two poles, we have mm -hmm. helpful people like Beale and Carson and Van Huser. Um, what does Van Til do to uh, maybe reconstruct a full biblical view of, of biblical hermeneutics Yeah, yeah. in light of all of that. Sure. Um, I think where Van Til is helpful and comes into the conversation is, first of all, in terms of how it's being defined today, hermeneutics, it's, it's more of a worldview kind of thing, which that's right in his wheelhouse. You know, he's, he's writing about this stuff all the time and he's writing about method, mm -hmm. albeit uh, apologetic method. Um, I think there's a lot of carryover transfer in terms of critiquing method based on a uh, standard reform confessional theology and theology proper specifically because you know, one of the things that Van Til does in his books is he kind of cuts across the, the those two poles, those two extremes of modernistic or rationalistic and irrationalistic. Um, you know, he says basically, you know, it's not retreating from one to the other or finding some sort of stable balance between the two. Um, they're both wrong as far as they go built on unbiblical presuppositions about reality and he would say and you know this is one of the main contours of his doctrine of god is is uh, the creator creature distinction um he talks a lot about that in his works uh in relate in relation to uh especially related to the fall fall of man uh, man in his sin seeks to subvert that distinction and in doing so you know romans one you can read that and you see this exchange going on <clears throat> and what it leads to 
And he talks about how uh, once man fell and tried to put himself in the place of God, so to speak, though he couldn't ultimately, uh, man ceased to know the limits of his own reason. Therefore, it led to these extremes, these unstable extremes of, okay, rationalism. Um, what I can't comprehend is, isn't real, you know, these extreme sort of um, approaches to, to knowledge and knowing reality. Uh, but quickly, man finds out he can't know everything. So what does he conclude? He tends to conclude he can know nothing. If, if I can't know it all, you can't know anything. Well, we know people can't live in those extremes. So oftentimes, and you see it through the history of philosophy, and he does this in, I think, um, his survey of Christian, Christian epistemology book, uh, he points out that every non-Christian philosophy is an unstable mix of rationalism and irrationalism. Even the ones that are said to be all one and not the other, because they don't know the limits of their own reason, they're, they're constantly shifting around. And, and the motive, Van Til argues, the motive for the shifts that are, that are made is man, sinful man will do whatever he can to preserve his own autonomy whether that's being a rationalist or an irrationalist or a mix of the two at the same time. And you see this, and I, I talk about this in the book with some of these uh, philosophical approaches, that there's elements of that. So I think to answer your question, Van Til sort of steps back from a biblical perspective and doctrine of God and sort of sets the table aright again so that we can see these opposing methodologies for what they are. So it's in very in a very real way. Van Til is a his thought can be used as a diagnostic tool to evaluate hermeneutical method. Go ahead, Colin. Um, so one thing when when I think and you mentioned this at the beginning of yeah. our interview. Um, the, the fact that when you open up one of Van Til's books on apologetics, even uh, his book, Defense of the Faith, mm -hmm. um, which is my introduction to Van Til. Okay. Uh, the first chapter is writer an overview of yes. the loci of systematic theology. And I've heard Van Til's method of apologetics is uh, basically it's described as the defense of systematic theology. That is the Christian worldview. And basically what he's doing is he's setting that over and against all unbelieving thought, pushing the right. antithesis and showing the um, internal coherence of, of our worldview over and against others. So would you yeah. say that um, applying Van Til's insights to biblical interpretation means that we aren't going to set aside systematic theology um, when we approach the scriptures, there's this tendency to want to atomize the scriptures right. and start from the particulars and then see if we can discover, right, universals, whereas, yeah. um, would you say that's a fair description of how Van Til can help us? Yeah, and I think, um, I think that's becoming more and more appreciated, um, the, the fact that, you know, one could say, one could object and say, well, you know, shouldn't we wait for the theology till the end of the hermeneutical process? The problem with that is because hermeneutics involves worldview assumptions, then what, what are you bringing into the method even before you get to the conclusion? And I think that is where Van Til can help us and be more self-consciously biblical about that. You know, you, it's, it's crazy because if you read some of these, you know, Christian interpreters who are, are writing about hermeneutics and uh, advocating more of a modern Enlightenment influenced approach, um, they'll say things like that, you know, like, well, you know, we, this is a neutral 
we want to be as neutral as possible is get rid of all the baggage, you know, so that we can interpret correctly. And they put off, you know, we can't conclude that certain theological truths are what they are until the end of the process. And to me, that's just, uh, that's, that's giving <laughs> things over to the enemy uh, before we even begin. And if you're caught up in that methodology, you may end up with conclusions that uh, run in direct opposition to what our faith affirms. Yeah, and that just seems like I, I could understand and sympathize with someone that's like, why would you start with, you know, theology proper before you even get into your interpretation work? That just seems very biased. And, you know, it looks like you're trying to presuppose what the text is going to say by your you know systematics and i can see why you know a lot of more i would say more like those moderate evangelical yeah people like you know i think of well specifically someone that comes to mind is like michael bird and scott mcknight some of those kind of guys mm -hmm. that would kind of want to be like no like let's be neutral let's you know let's stay away from systems you know even james dunn i know has talked about you know oh i don't want to be part of a, a theological system of interpretation but yet unknowingly they have their system <laughs> and they just don't even know it, you know, and, and they're, they're using a system just as much as they want to critique everyone else. They have their own. Right. Right. And, and, you know, Van Til, of course, would argue that, you know, uh, God has a system in his own knowledge of himself in the world. Uh, he sort of has the blueprint of everything and how everything's connected and unified in, in terms of his revelation. And so, you know, to deny that, uh, would run contrary to the teaching of the scriptures. Now, I would say in practice, you know, I wouldn't advise somebody, okay, just don't interact with any biblical text, just read the, you know, Westminster Confession of Faith, although there's, you know, exegesis undergirding that. I mean, we're always interacting with the text, and we're always growing in our knowledge of these doctrines, uh, but I think it would be a disservice to sort of set aside all that God has taught his church down through the centuries uh, as the church has had to wrestle with the texts, had to fight off heresy and formulate, you know, response to various things, uh, to just throw all that aside and start from scratch. Uh, you're, you're entering into a dangerous thing and that's something I don't think the Lord would, would have us to do to ignore all that he's done through his church. So, you know, there is this relationship. It's not just systematics overrides exegesis. I mean, they undergird each other. There's, there's interplay there. It's very complex, but um, uh, we do need to do good exegesis, but with theological sensitivity. Would you say on that note that really the loci that needs to be presupposed in hermeneutics is theology proper? I make that case in the book yep. because, um, you know, I'm consciously applying Van Til's thought to hermeneutical methodology, and that's what he did with apologetics. He really saw the doctrine of God as really setting the whole table for, you know, a philosophy of life and worldview. Who God is, yeah, he's, cre he's the creator. He, he creates everything else. He defines everything. Um, he is the Lord of knowledge, how we know things. He is the Lord of morality. He's the standard for morality and how we relate to him uh, in light of the text and all of these things. So really, these are key categories. And I think it's, I think it's biblical. I mean, the way that... Uh, uh, those things are talked about in the scriptures and the way Paul talks about, uh, you know, fallen man's opposition to those things in Romans uh, chapter one and two uh, plays, it plays out there. Yeah. So w would you say it's fair to say that when we approach the Bible, then we presuppose it's the triune God speaking so we, we approach the scripture already assuming the doctrine of the Trinity, though if someone says there's this one text is a proof text for the Trinity, um, we can debate whether or not that text is actually teaching the doctrine. 
right. but behind it we are saying it is the triune god speaking right so it's not like like you said this uh, presuppositionalism is not narrow where we just assume every text means a particular thing um yeah yeah i would say and you know there's there's an exegetical basis for that yes. assumption uh this is undergirded by uh many years and centuries of exegesis that uh so it's not just an arbitrary dogma that we're sort of adopting and running with but uh uh, you know, this, we can show it in the text. And, you know, because that's the case, you know, in, in one way, systematic theology is really just, you know, attending to that as you're looking at a particular text is really just doing context in light of the whole Bible. It's a contextual thing to, uh, to pay attention to what does the whole Bible say about God? You know, that's that's the systematic approach. That's a, that's a contextual thing to to take into account as we're interpreting particular texts. Yeah. Um, one other thought, kind of that's interrelated with this, Jason, is sure. you know there seems often to be two competing schools of thought or methodology, specifically with b biblical scholars and then theologians, and they always seem to have some kind of conflict with one another where it seems uh, one starting point wants to be the background, the culture, the best understand the text, and then say uh, theologians want to rely more on a systematic theology, or they want to rely more on exegetical work. What, what's some of your thoughts on that and how Van Til is re relevant in that discussion? A little yeah, bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the end uh, it would be all the above in their proper place. You know, it's like, like the those who would object to Van Til's approach um, see he you know many have said you know he doesn't believe in argumentation he doesn't believe in uh, uh, evidence you know like all these other approaches you know he's just he's almost like a fideist or one who just sort of assumes and you just got to take it by faith and there's really no more discussion to be had well if you any sensitive reading of Van Til you'll quickly find uh, he's not opposed to any of those things, but he's opposed to those things uh, without taking into account uh, some of those deeper questions. And he's opposed to using evidence and argumentation um, out of their proper place in terms of authority. So I would say when it comes to hermeneutics, uh, you know, I'm all for historical study. I'm all for, uh, you know, exploring the culture to understand the background um, for uh, grammatical historical elements and for biblical theology, redemptive historical context, systematics, all the above. But uh, in the end, the issue of authority must take precedent. Um, God is the final authority and he's speaking through his word. And so we can't all that to say, because I talk about some approaches in the book that uh, appeal to extra biblical works in the culture and the history of the time to try to make sense of the scriptures and they get the lens reversed. Yeah, it's no longer seeing the culture through the lens of scripture, it's the culture uh, through the lens of the culture seeing the scripture and interpreting it accordingly. So, um, I don't know if that fully answers what you were getting at with the question but um no yeah that definitely does yeah okay. yeah um sam or uh, dallas did you have any uh questions popping around in your head that you want to ask jason yeah um real quick i was wondering if you could speak on like what you think the relevance of to your this approach um like the theological retrieval movement um and like this idea of like pre-modern exegesis and thinking of somebody like craig carter or even like i know jv fesco has said like we've suffered from like having this enlightenment rationalistic approach to the text. What do you think? Um, like, yeah, just like earlier, you've, you've kind of already spoken on this, but just yeah. earlier eras have to teach us. Sure. And that's a good question um, because, you know, I've, I've always been struck by, it's a great essay. If you haven't read it, I would highly encourage you to read the uh, Moises Silva's essay has the church misread the Bible. 
And he looks at sort of these figures in the early church, which we tend to be like, you know, just dismiss them because their exegesis is allegorical and it's, it's kind of outlandish to us. And how could they make these connections? It's very fanciful and all of that. But he makes the point that, and I think it's it's well well put that from the very beginning, the church has wrestled with the scriptures as a divine and human book. Uh, your more uh, free flowing uh, allegorical approaches are really trying, you know, they may not be doing it well, but they're trying to do justice to the fact that this is a divine book with divine meaning. God's intention being expressed through these human authors that needs, it's, it's bigger than the human author. And that's a very real uh, truth to wrestle with. But then you also have in the history of the church, those who are trying to attend to the human side and the historical, grammatical, human author, because we would say, though it's a divine human book, dual authorship, they're not opposed to one another. They don't override one another. So you got to do justice to these things. So he, he makes the point in that essay that throughout the history of the church, you have this back and forth emphasis through various models and movements and interpretation that are trying to do justice to that. So I think that's a helpful observation. But in terms of like the pre-modern exegesis, um, you know, a lot of the theological interpretation of scripture folks are trying to uh, you know, retrieve some of that helpful stuff from the early church i would say you know it's kind of like you know for us you know you think of what's the relevance of this stuff to the lay person well they're interpreting all the time and they're doing some complex stuff in their interpretation but they're not self-consciously figuring it out or categorizing what they're doing it's kind of like we use the english language all the time but we're not always conscious about all the technical grammar things that we're doing at any given point we're just using it um you know through the history of the church the church has done uh hermeneutics and they've whether they called it that or not or whether that was the issue of the day or not they were wrestling with uh deeper things so it's not like they're totally uh you know we've totally become sophisticated now and they were clueless about these things they were doing that stuff too um maybe calling it different maybe not isolating it maybe not uh, defining it quite the way we do today but uh, i think there's many positive things that we can glean from the early church and their exegesis even amidst what we might say were uh unhelpful things so i don't know if is that kind of answer what you were getting at yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Colin, did you have any follow up before we go forward? No. Okay. Uh, um, so Jason, yeah. we, we've talked a lot about, you know, being consistent with, especially like our theology proper, but also our method and how our theology should influence our method and they should go hand in hand because like, a lot of people want to separate them. Right. right. Um, um, I guess what, what are some practical ways that we could, you know, maybe think through that and do that personally in our own thinking through the scripture and, and, and being, I guess, being aware of that. And what are some red flags we should look out for as we try to actually practically apply some of the stuff we're talking about? Yeah. And, and that's, that's a concern of mine too, because I, I'm ministering in the church. Uh, a lot of the people I minister to are not, uh, dealing in these uh, categories of philosophical hermeneutics, but you know, what, what's, what's helpful. I think, I think Van Til, as I articulated in the book, especially in terms of the issue of the new Testament use of the old, um, I think a Van Tilian hermeneutic is one that at least begins to think about self-consciously, what are we doing with the text? Uh, Am I handling the text in a way that's consistent with the message of the text? Now, there's a lot of depth there that, you know, varying levels people will get to. Uh, another aspect of the, you know, the importance of theology proper is we need to attend to the divine author. Now, that's a scary topic. What does that mean? You know, 
are there any controls with that? I mean, can you just say, you know, whatever in terms of divine meaning in scripture, or are we left with just the human author's intent? I would say, no, we're, we're controlled by the canon. We're controlled by the inner hermeneutic of the canon of scripture. So very practically, I would encourage people to be reading through the whole counsel of God. If you want to be a good interpreter, read through the entire Bible over and over again. Get used to how it puts itself together. It's not up to us, the interpreter, to make sense of a bunch of disconnected data. You know, it puts itself together, and we need to submit to the Bible's own interpretation of itself. And I think in that larger scope, we get we get a glimpse of what the divine meaning is. Um, you know, even in the New Testament, we read in Peter uh, that, you know, even the Old Testament prophets didn't fully know what they were talking about. <laughs> and that, that, that throws a real wrench into uh, a strict human author method. You know, how do you make sense of that? You know, what was his intent if he didn't even comprehend fully what he was saying? Well, in light of the entire canon of scripture, we get, we get a glimpse into the divine meaning, how the old speaks to the new, how the new fulfills the old, how Christ is the center of the scriptures, uh, how he's spoken of in all of the scriptures. We get a glimpse in how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. How, what, what are the New Testament authors doing with the text? You know, sometimes it kind of blows some of our minds and our categories of strict grammatical historical approaches. That's why I like Poitras's, uh, I think it was Poitras who sort of coined it, uh, his approach is grammatical historical plus. You know, he's, he's attending grammar history, literary stuff, but there's something more too. And you really see that something more in light of the entire canon. So I would encourage people to be, you can be a good interpreter of the word if you're reading through the entire canon and, and really learning to appreciate and submit to how the Bible puts itself together. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, I know that's, that's uh, super helpful. Um, uh, how, how does I, I mentioned earlier the the you know that we presuppose uh, theology proper the doctrine of the Trinity that's very much mm -hmm. a, a Vantilian approach yeah. uh, to epistemology um, you know but with that of course that would be applied to hermeneutics um, how does the ontological Trinity play a role in this discussion yeah um, I would say many ways but I guess. One simple way is that um, the triune God is an exhaustively personal God. And he's created all things in relation to him. Uh, everything's dependent upon him. So I would say when it comes to the hermeneutical situation, we are interpreting the Bible in an exhaustively personal atmosphere. Therefore, it's ethical. There are ethical issues, how we know things, how we interpret, how we do interpretation, how we apply our interpretation is in relation to God in a personal way. Therefore, uh, what we do with that um, is very important and we are responsible to this God who is Lord. So how we handle the text is an ethical thing. How we apply it is ethical. And as Van Til often use the terms, you know, everyone is either in light of that, either a covenant keeper or a covenant breaker. And he used the term covenant to sort of encapsulate this exhaustively personal situation that we're in. So we're always doing interpretation in relation to God, and that should impact how we do it. Thank you. Yeah. 
I mean, there's many other things with the ontological trinity in terms of some of the more complexities of philosophical hermeneutics, like, you know, the subject object relationship, the subject subject relationship, the I thou relationship that comes up in some of uh, Boltmann and, and others, uh, these distinctions that they're trying to transcend. Uh, and another throw this out there too, in relation to the ontological trinity, you know, Van Til made the point that the Trinity solves the one and the many problem. You know, the relationship is, is one ultimate or is, or is diversity ultimate, you know? And again, in unbelieving thought, they go from one pole to the other, one trumps the other. They're always trying to preserve one, but they deny the other. You know, in the ontological Trinity, the one and the many are equally ultimate. And that plays into these categories that I just mentioned. Um, now, those things your average lay person is not going to get into so much, um, but uh, on an academic level, those things apply. That's great. Yeah. Um, so, Jason, you brought up the New Testament use of the old and Old uh -huh. Testament use of the new and old and old, new and new, however we want to go about <laughs> it, right? And right. I notice you have that huge biblical theology collection behind you back there. Oh, them gray books, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, often I I guess a, a question we maybe you'd want to talk about a little bit about like yeah. so biblical theology often um for some people seems like it can be a pretty subjective hermeneutical thing where not not you know what i mean like where you're you're seeing echoes or you could say the old and the new exodus right. and there's these echoes of the of the history of israel with jesus in the wilderness and all these things and mm -hmm. um a lot of people are safe dealing with the text where it is right book by book right. verse by verse but you know it can be a little sketchy or scary for people to be like oh i'm gonna see how this connects elsewhere and you know beal right. is an excellent example of someone who's a maximalist as far yeah. as how he does biblical theology and then you have probably minimalists uh what are what are your thoughts on biblical theology and how is that helpful to understand like i guess how we understand that god's really the author of this book and then it's okay right. that we go about and try to see how all these things interconnect and not think it's just like this strange we're creating things that aren't there right right uh, that's a great question. I think that's probably one of the missing elements or gaps in, in the average person's interpretation of the scriptures. If, they're, if they have any sort of training at all in biblical interpretation, it's usually a narrow sort of grammatical historical issues, you know, get to the background of the text, you know, what's the immediate context. But biblical theology speaks to uh, more of a canonical context that I think most people aren't thinking in those terms. So when they hear somebody make a connection, you know, and say, well, this, this points to Christ in this way, uh, they're, they're almost skeptical, you know, like uh, that's, you're reading into the text, you know, or whatever. But what I, what I think is exciting is showing people that, you know, the Bible puts itself together that way. I'm not making that connection up look here, look here, and look here. It may not be a one-to-one -one connection. It may take, you know, three or four other texts to get there, but it's there. And I think you see the fruit of that in the apostles and how they interpret the Old Testament. They make connections that on the surface, you're like, wow, that is a jump. How does that relate to uh, the Old Testament context? And, but, but what they're what you fail to appreciate is they're taking into account all the undergirding context and the development of the story, development of things as they lead to Christ and his fulfillment. Uh, they're taking that into account, even as they're citing one passage. So I think there's a lot to be explored there and a lot to be encouraged um, among our, our people in our churches to, to think that way because the scriptures do that. Um, you know, Beale has a great little handbook. I don't know how accessible it would be for, for a lot of folks, but, you know, it's a, it's a sort of mini handbook on New Testament use of the old. And he talks about uh, various methods that are used and, and the assumptions built into those methods that are in play. 
Um, yeah, I, I think that I'm very interested in biblical theology in that regard. And I'll just mention one more thing. Um, you know, people take things out of verses out of context, uh, oftentimes in a narrow sense, but people take things out of redemptive historical context also. For instance, you know, things related to Old Testament Israel, the law, uh, the tabernacle law, uh, these types of things, that can be taken out of redemptive historical context and understood incorrectly, either disassociated from Christ or, or you know, there's many different moves you can make that are that run contrary to that context. Uh, so what I usually encourage people to do is be reading all the scriptures and be thoroughly contextual, meaning not just the paragraph, not just the book or the chapter, but the entire Bible. Think in terms of that context. Yeah, that's so helpful, Jason. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, I, biblical theology is a topic that <clears throat> um, I've recently kind of I'm a rookie Presbyterian, so to say the least, I'm very impressed with everything right now. So, <laughs> those, were, those were the good old days. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of like yeah. I'm, I'm still learning. I, I I still read stuff, and I'm like, man, I never thought of that before, or I've always wondered how this connected to that. And so, there's we're always growing. Yeah, and 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 biblical theology is just an incredible. An incredible thing to see how the Lord has really put his his book and his story together throughout his canonical, you know, uh, the scriptures in the sense that all these different authors all communicating the one grand message together and just how everything's so tied together. Like you mentioned, and I think it's Peter that talks about that, that yeah. the, some of the prophets, they didn't even know fully what they're prophesying and even saying. You know, and that's just incredible when you think about it. And it's funny, that does kind of put a wedge in some of the methodologies that we come up for how we do in biblical interpretation and the science of hermeneutics. Yeah, so, that, that reminds me of one other thing, just as an example from the scriptures. I think Poitras brings this out in his book, um, God-Centered Interpretation. He talks about how, you know, he's, he's emphasizing that there's divine meaning, there's divine depth to meaning, even revealed in scripture. And he talks about the upper room discourse and how Jesus in his high priestly prayer talks about, um, you know, the father has spoken to him a message and that conversation is being revealed to uh, his followers. You know, think about what is the nature of what's being revealed. Inner inter-trinitarian communication yeah. divine trinitarian communication is being revealed through human authors through a through a written text to us so what's the depth of that meaning i mean it's infinite because of who's speaking it it's, it's sort of a window into the, the complexity and the depth there that's fascinating yeah that's incredible we're actually having uh a couple of, I think in March, um, uh, we're having Vern Poitras come on and really? yeah, he's going to be, you guys are hitting on all the guys. Uh. <laughs> yeah. He's going to be talking about, I can't, I can't mention, I can do it offline maybe, but I can't mention the book yet, but, um, you know, he's, he's been in this, this, uh, I mean, he's just been, I don't know how he puts out <laughs> I, some of these guys. It makes no sense to me how they pump out the amount of material they do. But, uh, you know, he's been on this, you know, God-centered approach to yeah. all kinds of different disciplines, whether sociology, philosophy, mathematics, um, yeah. you know, all these different things, science. I mean, it, would you say Poitras is one of those guys that are really going after this, this Van Til hermeneutic kind of thing? Because I noticed you, you quote him a lot. He's in a lot of your footnotes. Yeah. So I know he's been a heavy influence on your thinking through a lot of these yeah, things. Yeah, I would say he's one of the most faithful and creative, you know, he's not stuck um, just regurgitating Van Til, but he's, he's sort of trying to uh, encounter new frontiers with application. And I think it's, he's one of the most stimulating 
writers out there in terms of, you know, he's thinking about things in ways that you wouldn't normally think about and in new ways. And, and so I find him extremely helpful. And um, yeah, I think, you know, these guys, they, they teach for so many years, they've logged so much stuff, then they sort of sit down and decide, you know, I'm gonna start publishing this or, you know, they get a contract, and then they start turning out the books, and you're thinking, man, I where do they got the time to do all this, but I think, you know, it's that wealth of material that he's accumulated through the years, but uh, um, yeah, I'm, st I'm starting to think, feel like uh, with all these giants on here, I'm like, you know, which one doesn't belong? <laughs> <laughs> these guys are top notch I, I commend you for your yeah the hosts don't belong you know our <laughs> guests belong not the hosts i'm just a lay person that likes to learn you know well i would say the influence on me um in terms of van till obviously john frames huge uh, i love his stuff um poitras um those two guys because they've written so much to have had probably the biggest influence on me. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you mentioned you went to Charlotte. Uh, when, when abouts was, was that? Yeah, I went, I was there for the MDiv from 2003 to 2008. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 yeah um, I was going to mention, um, I don't know how you wanted to wrap things up. But uh, did you want to ask anything in particular, or I had a, a yeah few ideas, but yeah, whatever you want to do. I don't know if any of you guys have any last questions before Jason goes forward with what he has planned here. Um, did anyone, Sam or Dallas or Colin, you guys have any concluding? No, okay, I see it had shaken now. So yeah, you're good to go, Jason. <laughs> okay, well, I, I just thought you know some recommended resources. Sure, um, yeah, for for geared more for the layperson, um, educated layperson. I, you know, I know a lot of people aren't going to crack some of these heavy duty philosophical texts, but, um, I think some accessible works that get to a lot of my concerns in the book. And I think Bantillian concerns. One is let the reader understand by, um, Dan McCartney and Clayton, I think is the, uh, secondary writer contributor but let the reader understand he covers pretty much from the philosophical theory side to the practical side and the biblical theological stuff and all of that um and there there's a more recent book by kathleen nielsen um i got it over here let me get the title correct um it's just called bible study following the ways of the word it's this book here and what i think she does in a helpful way is it's really about um literary genres which is another thing we hadn't talked about but something to consider in interpretation and and how that impacts our approach and what questions we're asking um, as we interpret different types of texts i mentioned the god-centered interpretation book by poitras that's a challenging read but it's 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 short and it's concise, um, but it's very stimulating. Uh, and then I didn't mention this guy, uh, Graham Goldsworthy. If you're into reading biblical theology, you know, you've probably encountered some of his stuff, but he has a couple works on interpretation, uh, taking into account biblical theology and how that impacts hermeneutics. And he has one called Christ centered biblical theology and Christ centered hermeneutics. So those are some other text and then lastly is a reference work not something you would sit down and read cover to cover but a good reference work to have on your shelf is the uh the commentary on the new testament use of the old edited by beale and carson so those are just some recommendations yeah no they're great and i'd also recommend your book jason uh you know and make <laughs> you sure a good sleep aid and you're, you're struggling with insomnia no yeah i i think uh listeners as well you should definitely pick up jason's book cornelius van till's doctrine of god and its relevance for contemporary hermeneutics you can find that i believe it's it's uh, the publisher's uh, Wimp and Stock, and you can i think i got my copy on either westminster bookstore 
or maybe it's on Westminster, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I think Christian book distributors, a number of online. Yeah, I might have got mine from Reformation Heritage, maybe. They're on there too. Yeah. 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 yeah we love Beaky, you know. Shout yeah, out to great. Joel Beaky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I when I contacted him to consider or contacted them to consider having the book uh sold on their website, it had to go through him. So <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i don't know how that guy reads all the stuff he does and writes all the stuff he does yeah he's putting, they're putting out some good things yeah and cheap too they yeah. you get really good deals buying from them i really appreciate yeah. them um but yeah it, it's uh yeah man i was just a quick story sure. you, know, you have one of your endorsements on here uh robert is it kara or cara kara kara yeah so robert yeah. Care. I was actually listening to his advanced uh, biblical yeah. exegetical <laughs> stuff, and he's talking about Van Til. I didn't even know he was a Van Til guy, and he was yeah. talking about hermeneutics and this relation. And I was like, man, this is incredible, you know. And then I saw your book. I was like, oh, man, this is incredible, you know. So well, I, I've told and, him before that in that class is kind of where some of the seeds of this stuff were connecting for me. Um, mm. And then uh, Dr. Lethem, who also endorsed the book, he was my uh, PhD advisor in Wales. So um, interacted with him and he, he's a, a brilliant guy as well. He, he's really an a expert in um, post-Reformation uh, reform uh, systematics. Yeah, I, I got his one volume systematic not too long ago. Yeah, that, that was a new, yeah. that's a new release, sure. Yeah. So many books, you know, so little time, <laughs> right? Uh, That's exactly right. But it's, it's at least you can own them and look at them. You know, I kind of joke around with some of my friends. It's like, you know, when we're kids, we collect Pokemon cards or, or <laughs> stuff like that. It's kind of, you know, eventually books kind of become like a collection that Oh yeah. You know, your wife's like, you need more. You're like, well, you know, I, yeah, I'll get to it eventually. It's just good to have for reference. You never know. <laughs> Exactly. You know, but uh, but books are great, and uh, yeah. and you're great, Jason. We we're so grateful Thank for you. what you did um, with this topic. I mean, this is something I've been thinking about and wishing someone would write on us specifically from a, a more Vantilian method of tradition as well. Yeah. And and you know, seeing this book, being able to get this book was just great to be getting into this and and thinking through these things and seeing just everything that you, you know, were bringing out from it has been so, so helpful because I went through a horrible phase of where I didn't really quite understand, you know, the myth of neutrality and there's no such thing as brute facts and all these kind of ideas. Right. And I'd read all these, you know, Scott McKnight and all these guys on these five views on inerrancy and five right. views on Adam. And I'm just like, man, who's, how, how can I figure out what's, what's legit in all this at this right. I, there's times that seem real rational. And then like you mentioned, like Van Til talks about that rational, irrational dialectic thing that yeah. goes on. And, and sometimes I just end up more confused than I was actually learning <laughs> or understanding what the heck to believe about all this right. stuff. So yeah, it's just, right. yeah. So grateful for this, Jason. It's truly a work that I'm so, so happy that that is out and available for people. Um, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I really appreciate your work in this. It's been a really strengthening and helpful thing to my own personal faith. So thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. And thank you for the honor of being on your, on your podcast. It's uh, like I said, you know, have the guests you guys have had on here is, is, is really impressive. And I hope the Lord blesses your ministry through this podcast. So thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate it, Jason. We'll definitely have to have you back on. We'd love sure. to have you back on again, That'd and we'll we'll talk about something else or whatever yeah. whatever stuff you like to do. We'd love That'd to have you back. Yeah, I'd love to do it. Any concluding thoughts uh, from you, Jason, before we uh, stop the recording here? I don't think so. I think I just want to leave with the, some of those recommendations. So. Good stuff. And we'll listeners, I will get that on the, the description of the episode for you. So you can just have hot links that you can click and go right to it. Some of these resources that uh, Jason has mentioned for you until next time, this is root and revelation podcast, where we seek to make God's revelation, our foundation in all of life. God bless. And we'll talk to you guys another time.